The same spirit was in the Mayflower pilgrims. When they left England, fleeing the tyranny of King Charles, they did not know as they sailed the Atlantic whether they would ever survive. And then when they landed here on these shores, they did not know if they would ever survive the first winter. There were no guarantees. Not for them and not for the runaway slave. They were runaways from tyranny of a king that oppressed them. And the runaway slave was running away from a system that oppressed him. And so, my friends, it is within the DNA of every true American, whether you came here, your family came here on the Mayflower, or whether they came here in chains to a plantation system. The DNA of America is the love of liberty and freedom. And we send this message from Lafayette, Louisiana tonight that Americans will not bow down to the tyranny of anyone who would rule over us. We will not bow to any king, to anyone except God. That is the idea behind the film and it is the idea behind America. But the territories of those who would possess our souls, possess our American ideal, they're beginning to expand. Jane and I began to really prosper under Ronald Reagan even though I was not quite on board at that time. But in hindsight, I realized that Reagan did, in fact, plow a field that made us prosperous. And on into the 90s, Bill Clinton even enjoyed the fruits of what Reagan had planted. And those of you who understand what it was like in the 80s, there was a big boom going on. And then the 90s came along and the tech technology began to increase and money was to be made and, and prosperity was to be had and we as Americans began to prosper in ways that we could not understand and in ways that we fully did expect. And friends, let me tell you something. America ought to be the greatest nation on earth. We ought to be the people who are in that shining city on a hill. We ought to have the most powerful military on the face of the earth. We ought to be feared and respected. Why? Because we have protected the freedom of everyone else on this globe. We ought to be and we shall be. I don't know about you, but there is something that has gone out of the average Americans, and I see some above average Americans in this room. But friends, we need a leader now who will put back into the American heart and psyche, American swagger, American pride in our stride. We need a leader who will not bow down to the enemies of this country and someone who will defend the constitution of this country without fail. We need that type of leader in this country. <laughs> Pastor, I'm glad you're here tonight. I'm glad you have the courage to be here among these rabble rousers and these patriots. <laughs> because I have pastored three churches across this country. The last church I pastored, um, I became a tea partier in uh, 2009, spoke before that 1.5 million in Washington. I'm an original tea partier. And we were building a new church at that time and I saw that 
a person of color was running for the presidency and then I began to examine what he was all about. Pastor, I had the audacity to tell my congregation, my deacons in particular, just because he's the same color as we are does not mean that um, he has the same values and they took issue with that. And then they saw that I was beginning to hook up with people like you. And um, they, um, they took issue with that as well. <laughs> but they were willing, it seemed, to forgive me. I'd been there nine years at the time. Uh, I'd been pastoring at the time for about 27 years and all. Uh, preaching for 34. And uh, began to make this film called Runaway Slave. And... Even though they were willing to forgive me the tea party thing, uh, they lost their minds when, <laughs> when, they, when I told them the name of this film. Pastor, they came to me and they said, um, I was Southern Baptist at the time. I'm now a part of a non-denominational church. And my ministry, my national ministry, is One Nation Back to God. We started it in front of 40,000 folks in Washington. The Lord has blessed us to take that internationally as well. Started the first tea party uh, as well, Monica, in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, we call it kosher tea. Uh, <laughs> there, in, in, uh, in a true story. But they came to me and they told me that I'd either have to go back to being that guy that I was nine years prior, pastor, when I came there, or they'd have to think about doing something differently. I wish them well. Friends, unfortunately, I travel across this country. I crisscross this country at least once a month. And, Pastor, the reason I, I mention this is because America has always been spiritually led by men of moral fiber. In fact, I believe our nation was created for a moral people. And... The British were always the toughest on pastors because they were able to inspire and inflame passion in the people. But unfortunately, I'm beginning to see in this country pastors who are too comfortable and too possessive of the comforts of their pulpit and the serenity of the four walls that surround their churches. And while our country marches behind those who are socialistic and those who would support things that our ancestors, our grandparents, there are things that we are talking about voting for. That if our grandparents could come back and hear the conversations that are going on about things we are ready to vote for, they would think we have lost our minds. And surely they would know that we had lost our way. But there was a time when pastors were unafraid to speak out against the evils in this country and in this land. And it is time now that we hear from the pulpits of this country because God still speaks through his word that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and, and pray, then will they hear from heaven. And he gives a promise. He says, I will come. I'll heal their land. We need God to come and heal this land. Yeah. My friends, the love of our Creator caused and touched the hearts of men to write within the Constitution of the United States the words that we have an endowment given by our Creator. And the love of our creator for mankind gave us life here in America, regardless of the avenues that we may have taken to get here. The love of our creator for mankind 
gave us as Americans liberty in this country and the love of our creator has given us the right to make choices in this country but it is the love of our founding fathers the love that they had for freedom the love that they had for liberty is what has given us America now as I prepare to leave you tonight there's a story that I'm reminded of that may bring this home to you and it's a story that I like to tell across the country my father bought me a bike when I was seven years old his father before him the first CL and I carry the tradition on because my grandfather, my great grandfather he was illiterate great man but if you wrote his name on the back of this wall he would not have been able to read it and um, all the boys he would name an initial because he wasn't able to spell the names of anything girls they gave names like May and Sue June after months and stuff and my great grandfather told my grandfather that if there's something that you need and I can't get it for you you don't need it my grandfather said that to my dad my dad passed it on to me and I passed it on to my son my dad was LC and before he went into the Second World War the induction officer told him you can't come into this man's army without a real proper name you can't have a name like LC it's got to stand for something and so my dad was trying to teach himself to read because he at the time only had a third grade education somebody had given him a book called Alice in Wonderland and he decided that he'd make those initials stand for Lewis Carroll the author of Alice in Wonderland and my name's Cleon Lewis so I'm the second CL and my son I decided to name him LC and they're about to have a boy him and his wife and so he owes me a CL <laughs> but my daddy bought me a bike when I was seven years old I had been bothering him about a bike for a long time but he wasn't able to afford it so I had to wait because the philosophy, the principle that we live by as bright men was that if I can't get it for you, you don't need it. So at seven, he bought me this brand new bike. I was really proud of it. It had the uh, big handlebars, long horn handlebars, the banana seat, and all of that. I was a real dude. <laughs> Bully comes along and he shoves me off the bike one Saturday as I was tooling around our neighborhood because I was one of the few black kids in my neighborhood that could have one. Took my bike. Ran home. Told Dad. Got my bike took. He says, where is it? I said, I don't know. He says, well, you didn't follow them to find out where, where it is. No, I didn't. Came to tell you about it. He says, well, get in the car. We're going to go find it. I said, well, I don't know where they live. He says, I'll find it. True enough, we looked a little while, but he found it. There was my bike. 
dad parked about a block away. And he looked at me and he said, go get your bike. I figured that since he drove me over there, he'd get out and go get it himself, you know, for me. <laughs> he said, go get your bike. Now this bully that pushed me off this bike, he was bigger than me. But dad said, go get it. I told dad, he's, well, he's pretty big, he's bigger than me. Go get your bike. I was more afraid of him, my dad, than I was that bully. So off I marched to get that bike. And the bully saw me coming. He comes out and there was one heck of a tussle. Yeah, he got the best of me that day, but I didn't leave without my bike. Moral of the story, I ask my father later, he pulls me aside, said, Daddy, you know, <laughs> he scrapes and all this. Why, why, why did you do? He said, the reason I sent you after that bike is because I worked hard for it. And the reason you couldn't find the bike is because you didn't pay for it. But because I bought it and because I paid for it, it was really mine that I had given to you. And the reason you had to go and get it and even fight for it is because now that bike is yours because you have earned it. Now, my fellow Americans, my friends here in Acadia, this land has been bought. It has been paid for with the blood, the sweat, and the tears of our forefathers, our ancestors. When Benjamin Franklin came out of the Continental Congress, he was asked by a lady, Mr. Franklin, what type of government have you gotten for us? Benjamin Franklin answered her, I have gotten for you a republic if you can keep it friends if we could look down through the annals of time and speak to Dr. Franklin here on the threshold of the year 2013 I believe that we would be able to say to him that yes Dr. Franklin we do appreciate what you gave to us. And we have kept and we will keep the republic. And my friends, as I leave you tonight and travel to parts of this country where many times I am unwelcome, many times shaking the hands of people who are unfriendly, many times in peril of those who are enemies of the Constitution and America. It is always good to know when I'm away from home that there's someone somewhere praying for me and I need to ask you just one more question. Are there any patriots in this room tonight? Are there any Americans in Louisiana tonight? Is there anyone who will stand up for God and country? Who will stand up for the Republic? Then Americans, stand up! Stand up! Stand up! God bless you! God bless America!